Now it would like to present Places for People and Alum's former director, Dr. Gary Morse. Thank you, Kizzy. It's also my pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar on effective strategies for outreach and engagement and to introduce our topic and speakers. Outreach and engagement are critical elements in any effective person-centered behavioral health care system. We know there's a great unmet need for mental health and substance abuse services in this and in every community. And sadly, many of the people who need the services the most are those who are least likely to receive them. There's a number of reasons for this. Often explanations for the lack of services to those in need are stated in terms of the characteristics of the people themselves with behavioral health disorders. For example, it can be said they lack insight into their own condition and treatment needs, or they're mistrustful and suspicious of providers, or that they simply fail to show up for appointments. The flip side of this explanation concerns the system characteristics that can pose barriers, such as long and bureaucratic intake and assessment procedures, that are difficult for people to sit through before receiving any help when they're in great need. We can also see the problem as one of a mismatch between what people want and need and the services offered by providers. One example comes from a federal grant to serve homeless people uh, with mental illness back in 1987, which was my first experience with an outreach and engagement project. We were establishing a mental health team to conduct community outreach and treatment. While we were hiring and setting up the team, a local shelter asked for immediate help with 10 women, all of whom had severe mental illness and had been homeless for two or more years. Since our team was not up and running yet, the superintendent of the state mental health center, who was my boss, agreed to help by sending two social workers from the outpatient department to the shelter. Social workers arrived at the shelter, announced they were from the mental health center and that they were here to help by taking signups for outpatient mental health treatment appointments. Only one out of the 10 women would talk with the mental health social workers and not a single one went for follow-up services. This was an outcome that some at the mental health center thought confirmed that the women didn't really want services. A few weeks later, after the new grant funded outreach team was up and running, we went to the shelter at night on a regular basis. We brought sodas and snacks and offered to assist the women with something they didn't like but had to do, cleaning up their area of the shelter, doing their cleaning chores. In time, we were not only able to share snacks and chores, but eventually to provide intensive assertive community treatment for eight of the 10 women helping them to improve their mental health substantially and to help them gain normalized, stable community housing. There was nothing magical about those results. Rather, it resulted from a willingness for mental health providers to change the way they did things, to meet people on their own terms and turf, and to understand and begin with the, with the person's own service priorities in mind, and to establish reliable, helpful relationships within the context of compassion and caring, something which is fundamental to most any effective service. Of course, there is much more to effective outreach and engagement than these few points. And engagement is something that applies to many persons needing behavioral health services, not just those who are living unhoused. Further, it is a process that may need to be ongoing or at least rather cyclical during a service relationship rather than a one and done activity. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us a very knowledgeable and skilled team of presenters who can lay out the strategies and nuances of outreach and, and engagement in much greater detail. Specifically, our presenters are Brittany Barber, who holds a MSW from Wash U and is currently the outreach team leader at Places for People. In addition to her work supervising seven outreach workers at Places for People, she facilitates on a regular basis system-wide meetings of interagency outreach workers serving vulnerable populations. And I've had the good fortune in the last few years to see firsthand the excellent work that Britain does in supervising outreach 
through several federal grant projects. Also, one of the presenters is Leon Farrar, LCSW, who holds an MSW from Washington University, who's a former outreach worker and then team leader at Community Alternatives before its merger with Places for People in 2011. In his 16 years of service at Community Alternatives and Places for People, Leon has worked in a number of frontline and supervisory programs for individuals who are vulnerable and sometimes challenging to serve, including people who are homeless with severe mental illness, individuals with co-occurring substance abuse and mental illness, and those living with or at risk of HIV. Leon is a very gifted and dedicated clinician who was recently recognized and promoted to the Director of Clinical Rehab Services at Places for People. And last but not least, certainly, we have Don Schiff with a MSW from St. Louis University, who is currently the Director of ACT Services at Places for People. Don has worked in a number of important frontline and supervisory positions in over 30 years of service, including in ACT teams for people with severe mental illness and co-occurring disorders, orders, especially those who are homeless, as a shelter director for, for Peter and Paul and a homeless outreach specialist. I've had the privilege of working with Don since his first ACT position, serving people with severe mental illness who were homeless in 1989. He's an incredibly caring and gifted person, very skilled at engaging people with special needs. More generally, the presenting team of Brittany, Leon, and Don comprised a very experienced, very talented, very dedicated group of experts on outreach and engagement. And so now we have Brittany, Leon, and Don as our presenters. Please join me in giving them a virtual welcome. Brittany, Leon, and Don. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that introduction, Gary. That was very, very informative. <clears throat> All right, so I do wanna start out just by acknowledging that today is 2-2-2-2022. Two, 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 mm -hmm. um, and we will be hitting two o'clock, two, two o'clock, 2-22. So we got a lot of twos today. I just wanted to point that out. Anyways, all right. Um, so yeah, as Gary said, uh, me and Don and Leon will be presenting today. Uh, I currently manage um, seven grants throughout the outreach team and have been working here at Places for People for just over eight years. Don or Leon. Okay. Thank you, sorry. Yeah, as I have nothing to add to what Gary had, had introduced, so glad to be here today for sure. Leon okay. muted. Um, okay, so what is who is places for people so places for people is a ccbh ccbhc um, organization providing adult children and adolescent case management services outpatient therapy um, pcrc and community employment services <clears throat> in the year of 2021 places for people has served over 2,000 unduplicated individuals throughout the entire agency Okay. Don has a grounding activity for all of us. You know how our social workers are. We're, uh, we're, we're trying to ground ourselves. We just want to open our brains and our hearts and our spirits up to, to learning today and to be present, to set our tone. So what I'd like to do is if you could follow me on a little trip, a little, a little fishing trip is what we'd be trying to go today. So if you make yourself comfortable, Let's pretend that you're not in your office or at your, at your dinner table doing a Zoom home, but that you're, you're walking in the mountains, maybe Colorado, and you're below the tree line, so it's, there's plenty of trees and water, but no one else is around. 
It says you walking down this path, I should say up a path, and the path is mixed with dirt and rock. And what's what's great about today is the sun is shining. We're up so high, it's cool. So it's like this this coolness as we're as we're walking, but the sun just gives us warmth. I think that's why I love hot fudge Sunday so much is that when you deliver that delicious bite of that warm fudge on that ice cold ice cream, that's the best. So because you're by yourself and you're so far away, you don't hear any of the sounds that if you listen closely, you're going to hear the buzzing of your air conditioning, the TV in the background or something going on, but not here. Everything that you would hear is nature. And the wind is a gentle breeze. And so you hear the cedar trees just, just rustling and just singing that song. And off to the left, you just notice that there's a babbling brook that's ever so faint, but it's so inviting that you step off the trail and walk down to it. And these mountain streams, when, when they're running, they're just so crystal clear and bright. And you look into it and it's shallow. And that crystal clear water just magnifies every brilliant color stone in the bottom of it. It's so, so picturesque and beautiful. And in that, in that environment that's so wonderful and beautiful, it's also forbidding because that's where the trout lives, the rainbow trout. And it's a very selective fish because their, their environment is just exposed to otters and eagles and bears, everything can see them because they can't hide in a deep or behind things. They're so exposed. So their, their 24 hour set is that they're aware of their surroundings. It's a very difficult fish to catch. You know, easier fish to catch, which I enjoy is like catfishing. To catch a catfish, you can sit on a bank or in a chair and enjoy a nice cold Pepsi and you know, or take a nap and you put your pole out and you sit back and relax. We put bells on the end of our poles so that when we get a bite, it rings. We sit there and reel it in. Intake workers are kind of like that, sit in their office, you know, chilling, chewing the thumbs and waiting for somebody who wants services to come to them. Outreach workers are more like the, the trout fishermen. They got to go out into the environment got to be careful where they step. These fish are so tuned. When you, when you step into the stream, it makes a noise that we can't always even hear, but since those sound vibrations and it'll spook the trout right away. And or our shadow, if we're standing with the sun at our back or cat, our shadow will cross and that'll spook the fish. And, um, and what, they're, what they're in there, they're behind a rock. So the rushing water comes down through them in order for them to survive, they got to be very selective. If they go too far out into the rushing water from behind their safe haven rock that they have, then they'll spend a lot of energy to catch that little bite and they come up and they eat mosquitoes and main flashes. I'm going to try to show this some of the some of the things we use to catch them. I'm going to put it on my thumb, but that's that's a little caddis fly, a little mayfly. And they're they're really small. And they don't offer much nourishment. So the fish can only come out so far to get it, or else it just won't be cost effective. It just won't work for them. And so I guess what we're we're talking about today is not the people that come to us for services, that want services and sign me up, but we're really talking about those folks that are 24-7. They're not treatment resistant, they're selective. They got, they got a lot of riding and they're just in their survival mode. In order to survive, they gotta be a certain way. So our idea is to like Gary mentioned earlier, at the women's shelter is, is to really get with them. With that, I'll pass it. Thanks, Don. That was, paints a great picture. Um, okay, so why are we presenting? So engagement is important at any level of care and at any time in treatment. Um, this work is hard and it is okay not to know all the answers. Um, I feel like I hear a lot from individuals saying that um, engagement can seem very complicated and a bit overwhelming at times. 
So the goal of this presentation is really to provide some real life examples from the work that me and Don and Leon have done um, and really to emphasize how your own personal strengths as an outreacher or as someone who can do engagement um, is important in the work that you do. So. Yeah, finally, I'd like to tell a quick story kind of to add to Gary's one time and the difference between people and the difference between people with schizophrenia or, or mood disorders. And I, uh, I was approached by this lady who lived in our community, Claire East. She was five foot nothing and she was working with development disability people. And at the time, back in the eighties, we we're just trying to bring those people in the fold we services because they were homeless too. And they were seeing they were getting services. So I went and, and was telling Clarice, yeah, come to shelter with me. And I was giving her all the tips and, you know, Clarice, you gotta be, you gotta be careful and gentle and, and discreet. And, and this is how I do it. I just look for people wearing extra clothes in the summertime or not enough clothes in the wintertime, talking to themselves and I'll go up and gently have a conversation. And her crowd was the developmentally disabled people. She said, oh, okay, okay. Well, she was so short, she got in the shelter and she, she stood up on the shelf, on the chair and blew a whistle and this announced, whoever was in special classes when her and the kids line up. Well, much to my surprise, 15 guys just from around the shelter all came in a perfectly straight line. I'm pretty sure if I would ask, everybody with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, please line up. I have the same experience Gary had with the women's shelter that he talked about. That line would have been empty. So yeah, it can be uh, to echo that, you know, this slide just kind of speaks to what Don's talking about that. I think right now we might even be, even be asking ourselves, you know, uh, we hear a lot of people in the media and our personal lives possibly that identify maybe more than they used to with mental health issues. And one might think, you know, similar to Don's story with Clarice, we might have people just ready for services. But part of our experience is that people um, oftentimes need help navigating the system. Um, sometimes it feels like you need a, you know, advanced degree just to figure out where to get services. Um, you know, and, and it is different for health, you know, for mental health services than, than other things that people aren't just necessarily showing up at the door. Um, and it's hard work, so. Next, Brittany. Okay, so engagement builds rapport. Um, so I thought it would be good to start with some of the most basic things that probably most of you do um, on your daily basis, but it's about being approachable. So um, you're building rapport by expressing compassion and empathy towards the folks that you're working with. Um, you come with a person-centered approach. So this is the idea that you're meeting someone where they're at, um, both physically and psychologically, and trying to support them as a person outside of maybe sometimes um, more of the systematic uh, kind of requirements that we have to um, follow when we're, um, you know, trying to make our grant numbers and um, get our notes done on time. Um, being welcoming to all responses you might get. So this is kind of opening the door to allowing someone to um, no matter what they're going through or what they're saying is to be able to accept what they're trying to bring and be open to understanding their perspective. Um, being visible, being persistent and being consistent. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful, but this is really key for a lot of our individuals, especially the most vulnerable. It's usually the ones that have fallen through the cracks and don't have, either have had bad experiences in the past, um, working with a mental health agency or working with a caseworker. And it's our ability as, as caseworkers to build trust and to show that if we say we're gonna do something that we do something. And then the main purpose um, of rapport 
is being able to understand the person served and what priorities they have for treatment. So not trying to make up our uh, make up our minds on what would work best for someone, but really trying to identify what they need and what they're asking for. So one of the first things is it starts with a sense of self-awareness, right? So um, when you're first starting to um, do engagement, it's about checking in with yourself. And, um, you know, a lot of the times we can get into positions where we're going to go screen someone new, but maybe we went to go pick up a client at the Metro link before that appointment and then the train is late and you're thinking about all those notes that you still need to do from the previous day. And so it's recognizing, are you in a place where you can be approachable and um, open with someone or are you dealing with some of the other conflicts that have arisen in your day? Because we all know there's lots of that. Um, what about your body language? So in certain situations, is it better to be sitting down? Is it better to be standing? You don't want to make it so that someone who's sitting down feels like you're standing over them and talking to them, but really kind of trying to meet people at their eye level. Um, <clears throat> understanding your volume and your tone. So is your tone understanding? Um, do you need to change or meet an individual's volume? And this, I think, is quite consistent when we have folks that might be um, a bit upset about something that is going on and it might not be directly related to something that you can change or you can affect, but being able to not meet the person where they're at and kind of bring them down um, based on your tone and volume um, can always be helpful to make people feel like you are a safe person that they can communicate with. Um, eye contact, so I mean, um, do you, is it good to make direct eye contact with someone? Um, is it clear that the person might be avoiding your eye contact and it wouldn't be good to, you know, look at them directly? Um, listening versus sharing. Um, so does this person um, want to be heard or is it more about asking for your feedback? I think a lot of the times as any individuals, you need to vent and you need to be able to explain what you're feeling um, and so as clinicians, is it understanding if this is a moment where I just need to sit and back and listen to someone or is it, are they specifically asking for me to give my feedback? Cause not, you know, sometimes when we're going through stuff, you're not always wanting someone to solve it for you. You're just trying to explain what you're feeling. Um, and then another big thing is maintaining attention. So, um, while you're in a conversation, you know, make sure that you're not checking your phone or walking away or starting a conversation with someone else that they know that you are, have their direct uh, attention so that they feel like you're listening to what they're saying. Yeah. Um, so this is my favorite slide of the whole presentation, um, but it's about outreach initial engagement. So, Building out or building rapport through a person-centered approach. Um, a lot of what I talk to my team about or talk to students, perhaps some students that are coming through my team or other community members that outreach is like rolling out the red carpet. We are trying to provide as many helpful supports as we can for an individual and make them realize that we are trying our best to, to support them. Um, I also put on here the Walmart greeter because that's kind of indicative of, you know, when you're walking into a store and someone's there smiling and happy that you're there, that's the kind of approach that we want to have, especially with our new folks that we're working with, so that they feel like they're wanted into, you know, uh, building rapport with you. So building rapport uh, during outreach efforts promotes, uh, promotes engagement, effectiveness, and retention. Um, so helpful real life examples in practice. Um, this, as you can see, is a picture of a dog. Um, this is my dog and her name is Bear and she's my best friend. And I can tell you that probably every single person that I have ever worked with 
knows that I have a dog and that she's my best friend. And that uh, the reason why I share that with people is not only because I love her, but because there's always something commonality wise that someone has, you know, something about a dog, either they had a bad experience or they had a dog growing up. And it kind of opens up that um, dialogue where you're sharing something personal about yourself, but you're still maintaining your professional boundaries. Um, I find this also really common. I was thinking about this when I was driving in about um, the, you know, I always apologize when people are getting into my car because it's dirty. And like, you know, usually there's someone that, you know, is like, oh, you know, my uncle owns a shop over here. You should take it over here. And that's always something that is creating an element of um, where you're on the same playing fields, but you're also being personable. Um, and so, and I'd be curious if you put in the chat some things that have worked for you all in the past as well, and maybe we could go over that in the Q&A um, section. But there's also ways of building rapport um, by being creative and especially using your support network. So a lot of outreach workers, something that's really beneficial for them is um, knowing other caseworkers that work at different agencies that are able to provide things that people actually need. So some of the things that we have been able to do in the last year or so is like provide firewood for someone that's staying outside. That's not typically something you'd find in our food pantry or in the back of our cars, but we um, know this is an essential need for certain folks and it's gonna show that we are being able to provide them what they need. Um, getting dog food for people, uh, providing outdoor essentials, things like we've gotten a lot of tents lately, hand warmers, um, things again that aren't as easy to run by. Um, and then in, uh, specific to our Welcome Center here at Places for People, we are able to provide shower and laundry, which is really helpful because there's not a lot of free services out in the St. Louis area that people can um, access those services. And then of course, access to food, right? Everyone needs food, everyone needs to eat. So um, being able to take them to a food pantry, applying for um, food stamps, um, getting food from our own, uh, we have a vault because we used to be a bank. So getting food that we can hand out to people. Um, and then I think something that's really important upfront with people too is being transparent around timeframes. So there's a lot of things that we wanna be able to do to support people, um, but some things work against us in terms of like, you know, you're turning in a food stamp application. It's probably not gonna be approved that day. You're gonna wait a couple of months and. Uh, you know, if the mail system's running slow or it got lost in the mail, these are things that we don't have control over as clinicians. And so I think being transparent about that and saying, I want to, you know, I'll stay in contact with you. We will, you know, let's call food stamps together if we haven't heard back. And then that kind of reaffirms too that things that, that are outside of our control are just as important as things that are um, inside our control. Don or Leanne, you got any? Okay. There's a lot of good suggestions in the chat that you asked for, so thanks everyone. Oh, great. For putting those up. Okay. There. Okay. <clears throat> um, so additionally, some engagement keys. So meeting um, an individual where they're at, both physically and psychologically. Now this might be like a no-brainer, but there really is something important about in terms of outreach of being accessible out in the community. So there's a lot of times like, you know, if someone is unhoused, you can find a central location like a gas station or the Metro Link um, that you can meet people at. Um, you, there's, you can always go out to encampments if you know someone's staying there. And I put in parentheses, always asking permission because that's someone's home and it's really important to respect their um, privacy. Um, you know, maybe it's someone that doesn't want to meet in their house and they'd rather meet in the park, you know, by their home. Uh, or if someone is currently in, hosp uh, in hospitalized at an inpatient um, psychiatric unit, you can go and meet with them there. Um, or if they're incarcerated in jail, there's ways that you can be a visitor during their visiting hours and go and meet with someone so they know that you're you're staying invested in the well being. Um, and then also psychologically. So, allow um, a story to be told through an individual's own lenses. 
um, and really being mindful of um, having their words be what describes their situation as opposed to sometimes we can make assumptions about what we feel like they're saying, but it's um, important to stay true to what they are actually um, uh, relaying to you. Um, refraining from judging someone's choices. Not everyone is gonna make, a, make the choices that we want them to make, right? So um, that's the same as refraining from making choices with our person served. Um, allowing for the right for self-determination. So they have the final say at the end of the day, it's their choice to um, uh, their treatment goals, um, their tasks that they wanna get done um, in, during case management. Um, refraining from presume, uh, presuming what someone's needs are. So you know, people, you might say, oh yeah, they just need to get a house or they need to do this or that, but it's not for us to uh, presume, sorry, I said that wrong earlier, presume what they might need. Um, if you say that you're gonna do something, do it. I think that this is a um, very important um, a uh, task for outreach workers and folks that are building engagement because that develops trust foundationally. Um, if you have someone that you're working with that is consistently, you know, missing appointments or rescheduling things that can feel like there's other things that are um, taking uh, priority in your schedule as a clinician. So being mindful of that. Um, and then a uh, reminder that any interaction is an opportunity to build rapport, even if it's just filling out grant forms. Uh, I know there's some of that is just minutia and you gotta do stuff and get it done, but there's always an opportunity no matter what you're doing with someone to be able to um, get to know them better and to build rapport so that they feel comfortable being like coming back to services or, or explaining if they don't feel comfortable with certain types of services. Yeah. Thanks, Brittany. I always like hearing the and seeing the difference between the physical and kind of, uh, you know, thinking of it in this physical realm and this psychological realm um, and trying to help people connect their uh, behaviors and actions. So a lot of times it's ultimately where our goals are in the long term thinking. Um, it also reminds me there's there's some part of outreach and engagement, and I think part of what people's um, what draws people to this sometimes is that there are some qualities and characteristics as well of of ourselves as staff. Um, I think with outreach and engagement work, <clears throat> we do uh, quite a lot that we're using ourselves as part of the instrument, the therapist as the instrument, and um, requires a lot of observation about what's going on in the environment and what's going on with that other person. Because um, each day is different. Um, you know, for us, each day is different for that person. Um, <clears throat> so over the years, these are just some of the things I've observed with people that I'm like, oh, that person really gets that engagement piece. That person really gets what outreach is. Um, you know, it requires someone who's willing to advocate with community partners. I think a lot of us, whether we're case managers or outreach workers, um, we're constantly trying to network. I think I saw Courtney type in the chat earlier of like, ooh, let's exchange contact information on this because there's a lot of people here that we could work together on. And it's, I mean, there's cert certain mind frame that goes into that of, <clears throat> um, I think uh, networking may be different for us in this field where it's like, how can I best utilize all these great resources to help the person I work with? Uh, not so much for our intrinsic, you know, um, trying, you know, trying to advance our own self-interest. It's, it's a, out of an interest in helping the people we work with. Um, so, you know, there's the other part that's, you know, there's being creative, being able to think on your feet. Um, you know, it's been a, being able to uh, sometimes come up with and be open to unusual solutions. Um, the third one on there that, you know, people, staff have to have some higher level of comfort with going at other people's pace. Um, 
there may be days, uh, you know, I myself am not necessarily a very fast paced person. Uh, but if I have someone who's uh, maybe uh, got symptoms of mania or things like that, I may have to adjust my pace to meet with where they're at. Um, similar, you know, there may be days that I'm am doing 100 things a, a day and trying to get a lot of stuff done. But for that one minute at a time, I need to really slow down with this person because of what's going on with them and really be in tune with what, what they're working on. Um, and I did hear someone, uh, or didn't hear because everyone's on mute, but um, saw in the chat that uh, someone brought up motivational interviewing. Um, I, I think there's a natural affinity to using motivational interviewing in this line mm -hmm. of work. I think it fits very well. Um, for me, maybe it's an observation, uh, maybe it's just my own personal bias, biases, but it, it's, I think it really stresses the interviewing part of that and less the long-term therapy part of it. Um, you know, just that part that, you know, questions create more questions. Um, and it, there's a lot of opportunity for asking those questions uh, that we find out some information about what's going on now. Uh, but I've also observed that outreach staff seem to be uh, just really impressive in the way they ask those questions. And even if it doesn't apply right now, they, uh, they log that away for using later. You know, it's like... Yeah, Leon, uh, I know we're getting... Uh announcement overhead. Uh, back to advocate with community partners, I just wanted to chime in a little bit. <clears throat> what I felt fascinating what happened with our homeless community during COVID times is that folks were staying in camps and everything was closed so they really couldn't get it out. And so different outreach workers from different agencies, BJC, Places for People, St. Patrick Center, Tent Mission, this church group, the city, we all just came to have each other's cell phone numbers. So whatever day we were out there, people got used to coming up, hey, can I use your phone? Or I'm trying to, can you get word of so-and-so? I'm trying to see if they can, you know, make this housing appointment for me or, or do that thing. So we're able to like just several times a day during that, that COVID time when everything was isolating, we would be making calls or getting calls and the uh, people that didn't have phones because no charging, you know, we just got to know each other and worked real collaboratively like that. Every once in a while, somebody would ask me to call somebody that I didn't have a contact information like Donald Trump or something. And uh, I'm blocked from Donald Trump anyway, that, sorry. But I do have the Pope's number. I did ask for if I could call the Pope. I tried it, but it didn't go through. Yeah, I think the <clears throat> using the technology is uh, important. And I, I think when we were preparing for this training, we talked a little bit about helping supporting people uh, using technology. Um, I remember <laughs> that we had a, a going away celebration here for someone who talked about, uh, you know, when he was doing case management many years ago, they had to make sure they went out when they went out in the field, they would take a, an index card with a quarter tape to it. And I, he got a lot of blank stares when he started to tell that story. And, and he said that was to, you know, in case you needed to use the payphone to call someone, you know, and it's like, what's this payphone? You can't even find a payphone anymore. Um, so we adapt with the times. Um, we do try to help our social network. We, we do try to advocate for people. Um, and I think it's about building that connection of things that we share with other people in the community that we work with. Um, unconditional positive regard has to be one of those. Um, it, it really is essential that we start there with um, the people we're working with are the experts that know how best to solve their situation. Um, and I think that goes back to being creative, uh, being willing to work with what are those solutions that a person may have that may may solve their what's going on with them more so than an idea I can come up with. Um, and, and in a way, I saw in the question and answer, and this only answers it briefly, we can come back to it later, but 
you know, a question about uh, what our thoughts are on when someone's panhandling and we may not have very much time to engage them just between a short stoplight and, and what do we do? I mean, I think it goes to that, you know, that unconditional positive regard. For me, um, you know, I, I like to wave. I, I wave, I roll down the window, ask them how their day's going, you know, if, you know, if they don't look comfortable, I ask them if they're safe. Um, you know, but if I don't have enough time to really engage in, in a longer conversation, I'm really just uh, making eye contact and um, trying to build connection. Um, and that's, that sounds like maybe just a, a small thing, um, but it can be really big and really powerful that, you know, we, we start somewhere and start with what we have. I also know that uh, when I was um, doing more street outreach, I would make a habit of carrying bus tickets around with me in my personal life, because if I didn't have enough time, I could, you know, and someone panhandled and I didn't have enough money or didn't want to part with my money, I could say, no, but I got a bus ticket. You want that? And sometimes people would be like, absolutely. Other times people are like, no, no, thank you. Um, um, harm reduction and trauma-informed language. Um, really just being aware that this goes to what I've said a little bit already that um, people's solutions for the, what they're trying to work on is, is really our target intervention here. Um, and being willing to accept any change at, you know, at this time is, is a positive step in, in, in a good direction. Um, you know, I, I think part of the harm reduction and motivational interviewing, and I may be stealing from a slide later on, but, um, you know, we, we always have to be willing and able and in tune with people to uh, see the opportunities that they are willing to make changes and really jump on it at that time. Um, and trauma-informed languages, I, I think is, it, um, at that very beginning stage, we need to be especially and acutely aware of, of our language and try to match that with the person um, that, that we're using their language and in tune to what they are. Um, to some degree, I think, uh, just like with a lot of things, outreach and engagement is constant assessment and tailoring our interventions to match what, what, we, what we're observing. Next slide, please. Um, so forgive me on this. This is a little bit uh, less fleshed out on my presentation kind of stuff. Um, I talked about that assessing readiness to change, uh, readiness and being willing to act on change behavior. I've talked about building support networks. Um, to me, there's some, uh, some similarities to crisis intervention. Um, and engagement. Um, it, it's not that they mirror each other or that we do the exact same thing, um, but I think a lot of uh, what works well with engagement is this kind of uh, brief, frequent interactions similar to what's done on ACT services. Um, we, we don't expect someone when they first meet us to do a three hour assessment and treatment plan um, we don't expect them when they've just introduced themselves to participate in a, in a group on trauma and reducing, you know, some of their things. Um, we, we expect that to be a brief um, interaction. Um, I also think that, you know, with crisis intervention, some of the trainings I've been to on that were, we're identifying that someone is uh, in a situation where they have elevated concerns, where they're not they don't have that um, stable behavior, quote unquote. And a lot of times when we're working people on engagement or re-engagement, um, that's what's going on is that someone doesn't have housing, they don't have linkage to care, they don't have primary care. There's a lot of basic needs that they don't have addressed. And so what we're trying to do is provide that brief and immediate assistance to try to return them to a state that they can um, act on their own um, to, to take care of their needs. 
I also think with outreach and engagement, we're doing a lot of uh, working with people to instill hope and a belief in that positive things can happen in the future. Um, so they think that's against the similarity to some of the trainings I've been into and with crisis interventions. Um, uh, I was just going to add really quick too that you know uh, this is just something that I was thinking about, but um, recently we had an individual that we had less contact with on our outreach team, and one of our staff who's been doing this work for a really long time was able to locate her down at one of the encampments um, and check in and see how she was doing, and that um, that reengagement really provided that individual with the knowledge that someone is looking for them and someone is caring about them. And I think that had a huge impact on this person, like coming back into services and um, kind of, you know, feeling like I'm not just going to be left, you know, like someone's just going to, oh, I can't find her. Now, you know, we'll move on to the next person. So I, that it's so vital that we make as many efforts as we can to re-engage with someone. Yeah, and I, and I didn't touch on it. Thanks for, for uh, bringing that up and a good segue. I'm, I'm pretty much uh, not very good at segues usually, but um, nope, back is slide still. Uh, the engagement um, versus re-engagement. I use a version of this for some other trainings as well. And, and I usually say that to some degree, this, this could go on for a very long time because our work, uh, while well, we're talking about outreach, we're combining the engagement and, and it, it's you know ongoing engagement. Engagement doesn't stop at the first visit. We could do this as engagement and re-engagement and re-re-re-engagement. Um, this is something that we should should expect to be constantly working on. It's a process, not an event, that we uh, have to continually engage people um, in their recovery. We have to continually support that. And to what you say, Brittany, I think voicing our support of that in a, whichever way is essential. Uh, now, next slide. Uh, so full disclosure, I, I do think I've uh, quote unquote borrowed this slide from Gary's, one of Gary's trainings a long time ago who introduced us so kindly. Um, it's one that I have uh, not improved upon and I really like from some of the, the outreach work we've seen before. Um, you know, we, we hear of this terminology of uh, challenging to serve. We hear of, and I think this is an effort to, to say, you know, in a nice way and be um, be kind in our language. Uh, but more often um, we hear words like treatment resistant or non-compliant or difficult. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip, uh, you know, asking for it in the chat, but I think, you know, we all could come up with a lot of language that uh, we've heard, perhaps we've used over the years. Um, a big one I hear still more today is um, mm -hmm. that person just doesn't want help. Um, you know, we hear this, this language and this perception. Um, and that's, that's what it, at some point it was it clicked for me that uh, what we're talking about is, you know, this is a perception of us as providers. We, we perceive that this person doesn't well want help. We perceive that this person is treatment resistant, or we perceive them as being non-compliant. Um, in actual fact, if we look at that, you know, it's uh, you know, if we're, if we're working with someone who doesn't want to take medications, um, they're being one hundred percent compliant. They're they're doing exactly what they want to do, which is to not take medications at this time. Um, they're not being non-compliant at all. And chances are they wouldn't be difficult if you know these darn treatment providers would just stop trying to get them to do things that they don't want to do. Um, so I mean, this is really just an acknowledgement that you know if if uh, you know people's uh, treatment resistance or these kind of this language, it's it's more effective that it's a 
you know, if someone's not utilizing services, it's a complex situation. It's, it's more than just a simple lack of desire or, or that that person is unwilling to get services or get help or get better. Um, yeah, I, I see that one and like that one too, Rhonda. You know, I'm working harder than my person served. Um, and that, that can be a very challenging one. Um, you know, Leon, when we're uh, trout fishing, Leon and I have opportunity to go trout fishing all together. You'll never hear us say, oh, the fish is treatment resistant or non compliant. <laughs> but we say, wow, they have such an astute survival instincts and skills. They're very selective. So, yeah, or we say, you know, thinking about yeah, somebody yeah. being selective. Yeah, or we say, you know, they're they're not biting on what I have on my line, right? You know, it's not that, you know, there's a problem with the fish. Um, We've got so many choices for them. Outreach workers have to have just as many choices as, as trout fishermen do. I got 10 different boxes with 10 different things, and sometimes none of them work. And the other the other thing that I think of, uh, you know, in a little bit more uh simple language is, uh, is when we're, we're talking about substance use and mental health services and other, you know, other health services and, as well. But um, I do think it's one of those things, if it was that easy, a person probably would have just gone ahead and did it. Um, if it was that easy to obtain housing and get off the streets, they probably would have just gone ahead and got housing and got off the streets. If it was that easy to, you know, and I think that applies to whatever level from small to large, um, you know, if someone's struggling with smoking and if it was really that simple of a solution of like, hey, you just have to stop, um, then no one would have any issues with stopping. Uh, it, it's a more complex, um, situation than just a unwillingness to, to stop um, or an unwillingness to seek help. Um, I think that's it on that one. Um, and I, this is one that I think we've borrowed some language over the years and Brittany and I worked on this. Brittany put some, um, some more current context to this as well. This is really what I, the way I approach my work. Um, and I see Joris type something in the chat. I was gonna say, I probably stole a lot of this from, or I think of Joris when I, when I see some of this and think of some of this. Um, I think, you know, a lot of what we're working on with trying to think what a person might be experiencing um, is we're really looking at what's their internal and external barriers to care. Um, Internal barriers, we can talk about some of those psychological things that Brittany had earlier. Uh, we can talk about, you know, their mental illness. We can talk about stigma with their mental illness. Um, we can talk about self-determination. Um, these kind of things that are going on inside a person's mind. Um, we also can look at external barriers. What are the things going on that maybe are in their environment? Um, maybe they're don't have control over things like insurance or transportation? What are these things that make it hard to get those tasks done? Um, so, you know, I really think when we're, when we're walking up to those unknowns in that situation where we're trying to figure out what's going on and do that good assessment work, try to engage them. We're really looking at those internal and external barriers and seeing, you know, it's, it's almost like, uh, big plate at Thanksgiving, you know, where you have all the stuff and all the sides, the stuffing, the turkey, the corn and sweet potatoes and all these things, and you really can't tackle it all at once. Um, so as an outreach worker, we're looking at what can we help with? What's one thing we can take off the plate to make that a little bit easier to get your needs met, to, to get what your goals are? Um, and, and there's a lot, there's, it's, there's a lot of complex layers to this, um, you know, substance use treatment, accessing it when a person's ready to make those changes can be challenging. Um, 
you know, getting insurance requires an appointment these days and requires, you know, access to technology anymore. Um, transportation is not as easy given the circumstances of catching two or three buses and making sure you know what time they are and um, just trying to plan for um, different things along the way that you may get stopped for. Um, you know, th these things may have uh, subsets of each one that we, we need to address first, you know. Great. Hey, journey. Leah. Yep. Um, someone had put a question in earlier about, you know, and it, may, it made me, when you were talking about barriers, um, people who, you know, your thoughts on people who've experienced uh, a trauma history, I mean, that can seriously be a bar barrier to engagement, and specifically folks who their trauma might have involved service providers in the past. We know that people have often had bad experiences with mental health providers or other providers. Um, it might have been as a child or, you know, even as an adult, but this is something that we encounter with, with folks who come with maybe have had having ex bad experiences with mental health or social service providers before? It's a great question and probably not, I mean, not probably, it's definitely not an easy answer. Um, and probably unfortunately happens more frequently than we discuss openly. Um, but I think it is, I mean, is that an internal barrier or an external barrier? Um, and could be both. Maybe there's good reasons um, for people to not want to access services um, because of that trauma. Um, maybe there's certain things about going back to that specific place or that specific office um, that are gonna be triggering and unhelpful. Um, yeah, Leon, with uh, in the past, just that being patient and having the expectations, but I know that if I can, uh, if somebody can trust me when I say and I can deliver, that I'll go with you beforehand. I'll be with you during the whole visit and afterwards. And if I can get, that's one thing that works for some people over the years, but not everybody. Some people are just like, nope, not going to do it. You know, don't bring it up. I don't ever want to see you again. But just knocking on different doors and trying different things is the key to success. Mm -hmm. So having a big tool bag, but that's one thing that's helped me in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's it's about giving people the opportunity. We we don't know until we ask and try. You know, again, giving people, empowering people to come up with their own solutions. Um, it, it does remind me of a lot of the work we do through CBT and things like that too. Of uh, if we're trying to get people, you know, uh, into services at a place, maybe we don't start with the intake appointment. Maybe we we do a lot of the smaller steps here. Um, we're not gonna go and do intake. We're just gonna go sit outside the building. Let's do a little bit of exposure kind of kind of to the, the possibility of the, that maybe, you know, and, and I think, you know, some of the things that we do on those check-ins before and after of like, you know, let's take some sort of emotional thermometer here. You know, before you go, what's your anxiety level about going to this place, you know? And when, you know, afterwards, you know, you, you felt like, you said this was going to be a, a 14 out of 10 when you went, but when you look back at it, what was it? And how do you feel now? Do you think it's possible to go through with, with doing this maybe another step? So th that's that pacing as well that, you know, it's like um, we, we don't want to turn the, the fire hydrant on full force, you know, to, to get a drink of water here. We want to, get what people can handle at the time and what they're willing to do at the time. I remember that relationships are so important, that networking that we talked about. So another strategy, I don't know how I did it, but it was downtown social security office and they had to go through metal detectors. And some of our most disabled folks that are you know, the most eligible that couldn't go through the metal detectors for, for lots of different reasons, that's my soul. And sometimes it's just like being homeless, I have 15 coats on, I have metal objects in each of those coats, 
it would literally take me two hours to get through that metal detector by stripping and going on. But with the relationship over the years and developed, I was able to get the social security guy to actually meet me on the side of the building. So they actually, this is unheard of, came out of the building and did the interview, not in his office, but outside right there. It's after several tries. And you got to really be friendly with folks and build those strong networks to get that kind of accommodation. But our doctors are doing it more and more where they're coming to the people out in the community. So just be creative. Sorry, Leon. No, that's, that's, uh, I've never heard of that happening. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's all I got on internal and external barriers. Uh, so a little bit of, you know, if, if I haven't been uh, stated it overtly, a little bit of uh, what I'm trying to get at here is not just that we do engagement at the beginning, but there's times where we have engagement when we work with people that are in services for quite a long time. Um, that, that's part of what we should be looking at. Um, engagement doesn't just stop at outreach. Um, outreach doesn't just stop at the beginning of once a person has completed an intake, we, we shouldn't just stop outreaching. Um, so, you know, we, we think of this when people have lost contact, um, you know, that they've missed appointments, that they're not engaged in services, um, you know, kind of that, that phrase, some of those phrases that we used earlier. So these are just some helpful ways to try to, you know, attempt to contact someone. Uh, and some of this, you know, for, for some folks may seem obvious. For others, it's, you know, it's it's different. Uh, we may have constraints constraints on what we're able to do at our agency. Um, but I think these are things we should advocate for and say are good ideas and part of the treatment continuum here. Um, that we want to drive to people's home or area where they're known to stay at. Um, mailing a letter, I was just talking about this earlier in the day, but, you know, when I check my mailbox at home, I got, you know, all the advertisements for, you know, things I'm not going to use that go in the recycling. I got the, the bills I set in one pile so that I don't have to actually look at them until i am got a little bit of time to decompress. And if, if by chance I get a letter that's handwritten and says, you know, uh, that's, you know, like a birthday card or, you know, from an old friend. Um, those are the ones I open first and I like getting them. So if we think of mailing some, you know, non-demand caring contact type stuff, um, if we mail a letter, say, hey, we missed you, we're thinking about you, you know, hope things are well, um, doesn't have to be anything complicated. That can be quite successful. Um, uh, you know, and we haven't touched on it in depth. I feel like it could be a, a whole training by itself, but uh, with outreach and engagement, we're constantly trying to look for family support networks and um, people who are interested in the well being of the person that we're working with. Um, that can be hospital social workers, that can be probation officers, that can be um, old neighbors, uh, that can be lots of different people. Um, you know, I, I, I think of one gentleman I worked with uh, many years ago who I would try to engage him. And I usually would be able to find him on a certain step downtown, but oftentimes I would have to drive to a different gas station or two or three. And I learned that I could go in and just ask the, the, the guy at the 7-Eleven, like, hey, have you seen my buddy, Steve? And they'd be like, no, I haven't seen him today. And it was, you know, just a, a decent way of having someone that expected to see that person, maybe not every day, but um, on a regular basis. Um, so these are all options for people we want to, you know, um, think of as who's that support network, who's their um system of people that they expect to see. Um, there's also other options for being resourceful with, uh, I don't have access to HMIS, but if I use my network, I can ask Brittany or 
Kevin or someone else to help me look up in the homeless management system. You know, if that person's been in a shelter, um, you know, I can put other outreach staff on alert, like Brittany and Don were talking about earlier. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, contacting businesses that that person frequents. Um, there's also, you know, online um, database systems, um, MoHealthNet, uh, for us, the, the state Medicaid billing system, um, CaseNet, finally, Municords, um, you know, look for legal and medical um, utilization. Do you guys have anything you want to say on engagement? Well, I just wanted to mention that um, VineLink. Uh, CaseNet and MuniCourts are pretty particular to the St. Louis area. Um, if you're not aware of those databases and VineLink, you can look up individuals in other states to see if they're incarcerated, but those municipalities have to buy into the VineLink system. But it's good if you're working with anyone that, that's a victim of a crime too, because you can put an alert on if they are released so that you can um, let that person know. Um, but I, I wanted to add too, I think you know, when we're, um, I, sometimes our discharge um, process can last a lot longer probably than what it should because it we, as our outreach team, do every single one of these things on the list um, and do our due diligence to make sure that we've exhausted every resource we could um, and every person that might have information is brought into that conversation. I think it's just so important to, uh, you know, not just assume that someone's just not interested in services unless they like completely say it to your face, but to really like do the due diligence of checking out all the resources. Yeah. Uh, that's thanks for transition to the next slide. That's that's what I said while I was on mute. And thanks, Christina, your comment on, um, I really like that. That's something that I personally am trying to encourage us to work on. Um, and really like that chosen family terminology. Um, I think it's something that we know family supports help people in recovery. Um, so I, I think we're, uh, it, to some degree, we're uh, not doing the best job we can if we're not engaging those chosen supports, those chosen family supports. Um, and it may be just something that's, it, it involves my own personal biases that I may not consider all of those, you know, supports as family. Um, so I, I, I recognize that both as super critical, but also, a, for me personally, it's challenging. Um, I want to be respectful of people's privacy um, and their their needs um, and ability to empower them, but I also want to engage as many people around that person as possible. Um, so it's I, I think something we have to improve upon as a as a whole, in my opinion. Um, so critical times for engagement. Is this you or me, Brittany? Is this me still? All right. Um, so just a word about this. This is part of what our policy is at Places for People, um, you know, but also born from what's, you know, uh, good ideas. Um, there, there's, there's critical times that we have transitions uh, when people are admitted to the hospital, uh, when people are discharged from the hospital, when people are admitted or discharged from jail. Um, released from jail, I think is the terminology. Um, but, you know, uh, also before and after substance use treatment. Um, you know, these are vulnerable times that we want to make sure that we're engaging with people and trying to find out as much information as we can. Um, <clears throat> look for opportunities that we're able to, to work through that. You know, do we, provide transportation, um, how soon do we follow up? Um, I think sometimes with <clears throat> our perspective from a professional point of view is, you know, 72 hours is such a short period of time. Um, but I also know in my 
personal view of this is, you know, it's like, well, I did that yesterday. I got a whole lot of other stuff that I have to do today. So the closer we're able to get to that discharge up to and including, hey, I'll give you a lift home. Um, you know, that's that's a lot, a lot easier for people to um, remember actually to stay in touch. So. Um, and then look for ways we can support. Well, do you need medications? Do you need prescriptions filled? Um, do you know how to take those medications? Do you have a safety plan? Do you have a, a wraparound plan? And these are all good questions to engage people and get them talking about it. Um, and I know we've got some, some folks working on legal issues on the training. I, I saw a couple of those on the chat. Um, so same thing, and I think you guys would be heartfelt in, in, in this, that we, we need to be engaged in these things um, after release from incarceration as well. Uh, I think this is less of a new thought now, but um, some years ago that was, you know, uh, not really something we would consider doing, um, especially, especially with, you know, people who are using substances and, and people with safety plans. We, we want to engage them as quick as possible. Um, I just want to speaking specifically from the um, like outreach world, uh, you know, if you're picking someone up from the hospital or from a jail, you actually get the opportunity to take them wherever they need to go. So if there is a chance that you lose contact or aren't able to make it to the next appointment, you have a frame of reference that will work towards finding them in the future. So it could be a friend's house or you know, even someone they haven't listed on any of their records or in their medical records. So it, I, the end, it shows that we're willing to invest in their well-being after such, like Leon said, a very vulnerable um, time for them. Thought I'd answer one of the open questions. Um, before we do the last two slides, because I think we're doing pretty good on time. Um, see the question about, you know, how do we be empathetic while still being mindful of self-disclosure? And it can be a tricky balance sometimes. Um, you know, I think uh, this is something that comes up fairly frequently is, you know, then and, and Brittany's talk earlier about her, her dog bear. Um, sometimes we do have some go-to things that we, we pull out of the tool, toolbox um, that we, we discuss. I think ultimately it goes to that being, um, being honest and, and voicing what we're willing to, to disclose as well. Um, you know, I, I think for me, a lot of times when I'm, you know, if we do have someone successfully engaged and we're working on maybe doing a full-fledged assessment and treatment plan, uh, one of the questions I usually say, or I tell people at the beginning, and then I, I ask them at the end is, you know, hey, I just asked you a whole lot of questions. And I told you at the beginning, if you don't feel comfortable answering those, you can say, no, I don't want to answer that question. And then at the end, I say, hey, are there any questions for me? And if I don't feel comfortable answering them, I say, no, I don't feel comfortable answering that. Um, so I think being direct and being honest and, and it's, you know, maybe transparency, but, but labeling it for what it is and, and owning up to our own emotions as well. That, you know, that, that's kind of a tricky thing for me to to talk about. So how about I don't answer that now? And if I feel comfortable later, I'll get back to you. Um, but it's, it's certainly not an easy one. And I think it's, it's something that takes constant consideration. The last two. Yeah, uh, I'd like to uh, share a story about you know just being safe out there. There's a when we're in those troubled waters and you're using all your your fun resources and different things that you can can try because not every one of them works. But it's not the people that we're outreaching that really cause us the greatest danger. But it's some of the people that are preying on the people those that are most vulnerable and the most easy targets. 
for the ne'er do wells. In, a, in a 2004, I think I was out <clears throat> doing outreach, and people who have a mood disorder that require daily medication in order to stabilize mood because we don't have a long acting injection that works for a lot of people, if anybody. So people, particularly who are mania, would be the folks that are like, oh, they're difficult to engage. And I remember I was out looking for this girl. She was a sex worker and in our community in St. Louis back in the early 2000s, Wellston was a, a troubled community as far as that little strip where the, the hourly rate motels were. So in addition to the mood disorder, she had a serious addiction. And so, which, you know, doesn't long need to be a sex worker. And I'm, I'm out looking for, and I have a stated time and place to go look for. I wanted to do it in the morning, every time in the morning, I'll be here, you be here, we'll go out. One day she wasn't there, so I was like, oh, and I drove a couple blocks around, you know, looking for her. She's around here somewhere and I see her. So I, I'm driving up to her and I see these three guys just about a block and a half away from her coming in. And my spider senses went off. Oh, these guys are meaning, not meaning well. I'm going to go get her and, and throw her in my car. So I whip the car around. I'm sitting there. She comes to the door. And like a lot of people with mania, they're really busy and they work really hard, but they can't do anything fast. So she was out the door trying to figure out how to open a door and get in the car and share all this information that's going on. And the next thing I see is this hand go around her, grab her by the throat, throw her on the ground. And before I knew what happened, this guy's in the car with a gun on me pointed at my belly, screaming at me to drive, drive, drive. And for some reason, um, a long time ago, one of my, my priest teachers told me that, Don, you got nothing to worry about because only the good die young. So it's like, Don, you're not good enough to die today. So I was able to remain calm for whatever reason. I don't know why it was. I just said, no, I'm not going. I did remember, don't take him when the next, he wanted me to take him to an ATM to get money because I gave him all my money, both dollars from my wallet. I'm a social worker. It was in 2004, so we carried around little pagers. Some of you might not know what those are, but most of us do. Those little devices, and then we'd get that page and we'd go take our quarter and go down the road. I believe Gary Morris was the first person I called after this event happened because I was after he got out and told me, come back, then I'll, I'll give you the money. Um, so I'm going on with the story, but my, my point is, is that when you're out there in the waters, you know, trying to help people, just be aware of, of your spider senses, touch your guts. I made a mistake of like, she's not at the point in time. I felt like I was gonna save her. And, you know, honestly, I put her probably more at risk because I remember her screaming, one of the guys, or three guys, and she screamed one of the names. And when I saw her a couple of weeks later, she said that, uh, yeah, but I really got beat up bad because I said their name out loud and keep your, my name out of your mouth when something's going done. So catching myself trying to, trying to help somebody and doing good work, it's really, you know, just use caution. And, and I can't say that there's a way to be safe 100% of the time, all the time, but but use your best, you know, instincts to to do that. Sorry if I got off topic a little bit. Last thing we got on there is uh, self care. I think we're we're. Um, wrapping up pretty soon. Um, I, I think self-care can be uniquely challenging for, for this engagement piece um, and the outreach part. Um, there's a large part of outreach and engagement that we don't necessarily see the outcomes, uh, the fruit of all our outreach and engagement efforts. <clears throat> a lot of what, what is done may be linking to more long-term services. Um, so we do all this work and we, our success is that this person may 
go into inpatient treatment somewhere or may be connected with an ACT team that they work with for a long time. <clears throat> and so we may not be part of the long-term journey. So I think there can be some unique self-care things. Um, I think it's also one of those jobs where it's, you know you're doing it well when people don't know you're doing, doing any work. Um, when people have that, you know, that I did this all on my own and you're like, yes, that's awesome. I'm so glad you did. Um, that's when we, you know, that's kind of what we know um, inside, we have to really appreciate that as the ultimate compliment. <clears throat> I remember at one point, uh, this was an early jail diversion person that worked with uh, Outreach Person Spring uh, many, many years ago. And I think Spring spent, you know, better part of a year and a half, just constant work and doing lots of Lots of good things, lots of hard days. Um, and I remember, you know, in drug court or in a mental health court, they do a celebration at the end of, yay, you're graduating, you're getting rid of these, you know, you got rid of five charges three months ago, we're, we're dropping your other five charges. And I remember this person stood up in front of the judge in the whole courtroom and, you know, the judge asked him what, what went well, and he said, well, I just had to really figure out how to do things on my own, because, you know, those, those outreach workers aren't going to do everything for me. I mean, I got to, I really had to do it all on my own, because they just, they weren't doing anything for me. And it was, you know, it was, in a way, it was jaw dropping. On the other hand, it was like, yay, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, you, you did, I mean, because it's true. You did a lot of hard work, um, a lot of things that honestly none of no one else could have done. Um, so these things, you know, I think go into it that you know we got boundaries. We want to understand our own trigger points. Um, want to be able to support coworkers. You know, that whole idea of uh, seeking and responding to relationships is is critically important for. Um, our staff, our co-workers, our colleagues, our peers in the field, um, and supervision is, is essential. You know, having someone that you um, are able to check in with when you're out in the field, someone you are able to consult with. I think supervisors as well need someone that they're able to con consult with. And that's certainly something that I've benefited over the years is having um, other people where I'm like, hey, you've you've done this before. What what would you respond in this type of situation? Yeah. You know. Um, so being able to have um, not just people that are in it right now, but have some understanding of what was going on and and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I really like the be kind to your future self, Brittany. That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, and I saw there was a comment um, uh, in the chat, but it's it's something that as a supervisor and something that I wish I would have uh, paid attention to when I was out doing the outreach work day to day is, you know, essentially we want to be able to provide uh, engagement and going and outreaching people, right? Like that's why we do this work. And I think a lot of the times we can get we can catch ourselves falling into these ruts where we're behind on our notes or we're behind on paperwork. And so the idea is, um, you know, if you have a spare moment or if you can plan into your schedule, how you can set aside time to get the things done that you might not want to get done so that you in the future can do the things that you will have time to do the things that you want to do. It's a newer concept that I've uh, become aware of, but I think that um, it's helped kind of motivate someone to think about what goals they have in terms of meeting their clients' needs in the future. So yeah. All right, well, that was our presentation. So you guys pretty much answered the, responded to the Q&A throughout. So I don't know if anyone else has any questions you wanna add as we're ending. 
Yeah, I don't see questions coming through. Just lots of thank yous and great presentation. Um, great job. Yeah, I think when we did this presentation um, back like a couple years ago now, we had also given the option, and I don't know if this is how to the loom, but to send questions that we would be happy to answer too, if anyone had specific questions. Um, yeah, that would definitely be a possibility. They should also have my email as well. If they want to get in contact with anyone, then I can uh, push it forward to whoever they need to communicate with. I see a few people are asking about CEUs as well. So when you registered for the webinar, you should have filled out information for CEUs. Um, I, it usually takes about 14 business days to gather all the information, attendance records, and your certificate will be emailed to you um, along with any other information about the webinar. Well, that doesn't look like there's any more questions right now coming through. So thank you guys. Great presentation. Thanks. Thanks so much. Everybody take care. Bye-bye.